Welcome, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to our live stream. Welcome to the Church of Omaha on our live stream. As we say often, we're glad you're here, but if you can also join us in person, we would love to have you visit and be a part of what God is doing in our midst. Well, tonight we're going to look into Proverbs chapter 9 and see what the Lord has to say for us from this chapter. <clears throat> My title for tonight will be, Which Way Did He Go? Amen. Which way did he go? Allow me to read Proverbs 9. Wisdom has built her house. She has hewn out her seven pillars. She has killed her beasts. She has mingled her wine. She has also furnished her table. She has sent forth her maidens. She cries upon the highest places of the city. Whoso is simple, let him turn in here. As for him that wants understanding, she says to him, Come, eat of my bread, drink of the wine which I have mingled. Forsake the foolish and live, and go in the way of understanding. He that reproves a scorner gets to himself shame. And he that rebukes a wicked man gets himself a blot. Reprove not a scorner, lest he hate you. Rebuke a wise man, and he will love you. Give instruction to a wise man, and he will yet be wiser. Teach a just man, and he will increase in learning. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. For by me your days shall be multiplied, and the years of your life shall be increased. If you be wise, you shall be wise for yourself, but if you scorn, you alone shall bear it. A foolish woman is clamorous. She is simple and knows nothing. For she sits at the door of her house on a seat in the high places of the city to call passengers who go right on their ways. Whoso is simple, let him turn in here. And as for him that wants understanding, she says to him, stolen waters are sweet and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. But he knows not that the dead are there and that her guests are in the depths of of hell. Again, my title tonight is Which Way Did He Go? Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for the opportunity once again to minister and teach your word. I pray that you would help me to walk in your spirit and not in my flesh, and that we would understand and comprehend what your scripture says to us, that we might apply it obediently. In Jesus' name, amen. Have you ever taken a wrong turn and ended up lost? How long did you keep driving before you stopped and asked for directions? I remember a time I was traveling from Missouri to Maine, talking and enjoying the drive, until I realized I had driven nearly 60 miles in the wrong direction. Now, thankfully, I could turn around, head in the right direction, before I had gone too far out of my way. But how easy is it to get distracted and miss a turn? You see, life is like that. It's about choosing a path to follow, walking in it, and avoiding distractions. Those who pay attention to walking wisely experience life. Those who walk in the way of their flesh wind up in the depths of hell. Now at the risk of redundancy in these messages in the book of Proverbs, I want you to carefully notice how often God's word presents and gives a choice between two ways. The more I study and the longer I dive into the word of the Lord and teach it, the more I see this theme in all of scripture. It's in the Old Testament and the New. It's in the poetic books. It's in the prophetic books. It's in the teaching of Jesus. It's in the epistles. It's everywhere. You see, I've seen too many people forsake God, loving this world. And ironically, I've, I've watched many of them paint a picture that they're happy and uh, just wonderful in life, but they actually end up worse than if they had remained faithful. But thankfully, some of them, like the prodigal, have made their way home. 
and have been blessed to be back in the Father's house. And I might add, if you're listening to this and you're a prodigal, come on home. We'll kill the fatted calf for you. We've got the ring, robe, and shoes for you. Come on home. Because I've also seen some, unfortunately, drift further from God. Now, I've also seen saints remain faithful despite the challenges that they deal with. And the more that they serve God, the more they grow in faith. So as you listen to this message tonight, I want you to hear the heart cry of, of this pastor and bishop. Please consider eternity when you decide which path you want to walk on. If you've taken a wrong turn or are on the wrong way, it's not too late to turn around. Listen to God's GPS telling you rerouting, rerouting, and get back on the right track. If you're on the right path and, and you're struggling with difficulties and you're wondering what's going on and why you're prayers haven't been answered yet or why you don't feel those Holy Ghost goosebumps like you used to, I urge you to remain faithful because God never leaves nor forsakes and his strength will enable you to endure to the end if you'll just persevere. With that introduction, let's talk first from chapter 9 about the way of understanding. In the first six verses, Solomon describes the way of understanding. And specifically, he mentions that in verse 6. He metaphorically is describing and illustrating a wealthy home. Has seven columns. The seven-pillared home. Um, uh, a feast worthy of royalty. You can see this in the first five verses again. And before revealing anything about the foolish way or the folly of the foolish way, which is verses 13 through 18, Solomon urges everyone to forsake the foolish and live. Right in verse 6, he says it that way. Forsake the foolish and live. So thus, it is far wiser to hear and obey the call of wisdom, as we see in verse 3. The banquet feast that Solomon describes in those verses and, and even prepares, you might say, is similar to the words that God gave to the church of Laodicea in Revelation 3.20. You see, those who open the door to Jesus will enjoy fellowship with him. And as the book of Revelation comes to its finale, we see God inspiring these words. And the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him that hears say, come. And let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. That's in chapter 22, 17 of Revelation. You see, the call of wisdom goes out to whosoever will. And those who respond obediently will walk on and in the way of understanding. And everything wisdom serves in its seven-pillared house far surpasses everything else. I've been to a number of restaurants in my 51 years of life. But you know, I don't know that one of them has been perfect every time. Oh, there's been a few that, that are right up there where they've only had a few minor mistakes. Maybe they gave me regular Coke instead of Diet Coke. Or maybe I ordered a ribeye, but they were out of ribeyes or something like that. But, but you know, um, not one of them has been perfect. But the, the feast that wisdom serves is always perfect, always right, always good. Here's what's interesting. If you remember from chapter 7, the harlot must do things secretly while her husband is gone. That's in Proverbs 7, verses 19 and 20. In Proverbs 9, verse 17, we see that the foolish woman must provide her sensual delicacies also privately. And those who follow those ways are, end up in death. 
And yet, here's the wise woman, not having to do anything privately, not having to do anything secretly or seductively, but yet those who listen to her walk in the way of understanding and live. I don't mean to be rude, but is there really a choice? I mean, if, if this path over here leads to life and blessing and, and there's nothing sexual or seductive or private or secretive or, and, and, and it's perfect and it's always good and it's like God and this over here leads to death, I mean, is there really a choice? Some must think there are. Some must think there is a choice because they do choose, unfortunately, the wrong path. Well, with that, let's take a look at chapter 9, verses 7 through 12, and look at the beginning of wisdom. Because in between contrasting wisdom and folly, God inserts, has Solomon insert six verbs to remind you that you are responsible for your choices. That's what verses 7 through 12 do. No one, no one will be able to bring a charge against God on the day of judgment. There will be no appellate courts. There will be no juries. There will be no attorneys that you can hire. There will be no Fifth Amendments that you can plead. Everyone has the same chance to hear, believe, and obey the gospel message. And in God's loving mercy, he extends the call of wisdom to everyone. And his hope is that everyone repents. And we know this because in 2 Peter 3, 9, he's, it, it mentions that he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So hence, where you spend eternity is entirely dependent upon you. In these six verses, verses 7 through 12, Solomon shows many different people. In verses 7 and 8, he mentions a scorner. In verse 7, he mentions a wicked man. In verses 8 and 9, a wise man. And in verse 9, also a just man. So you see the wise, the just on one side, and you see the scorner and the wicked on the other side. If you become wise, you reap the benefits of wisdom. But if you scorn God's ways, you suffer. Some have asked, why would a loving God send anyone to a devil's hell? But that's the wrong question. Because the Bible explains to us hell was not made for us. It was made for the fallen angels. And so the, the, the real question should be, why would anyone choose hell over a loving God? That's the real question. Also, in these verses, verses 7 through 12, I want you to note the differences in correction. If a scorner or a wicked person is rebuked or reproved, they will insult, hurt, and hate those who attempt to correct them. But a wise person, a just person, will accept the discipline and become more wiser, loving all who help them. So, I would say, if you sincerely desire to increase in learning, which is what verse 9 says, then you will also receive reproof and mature in Christ. In verses 13 through 18, Solomon reveals to us the foolish and fleshly way. You see, it's with loud seductive words that the foolish woman allures her prey. The naive listen to her. The forbidden delicacies appeal to his flesh. But he's unaware that the dead are in her house and, as verse 18 says, and that her guests are in the depths of hell. And he doesn't realize this until it's too late. Until he's already Signed on the dotted line, so to speak. These verses express the dangers of choosing the wrong path. 
Let me just pause here and say that the pleasure of immorality is not worth the pain it causes. It is a sin. It hurts God. It damages your witness, your spouse, your character, your health. So please consider Proverbs 9 and all of these Proverbs and scriptures beyond Proverbs that deal with this topic. And please do everything you can to avoid sexual sin at all cost. I might just interject, that includes pornography. When you're looking at those pictures or videos, if they're videos, that's someone's daughter. That may be someone's wife. And Jesus said, if you look on a woman to lust after her, you've already committed adultery in your heart. But allow me as well to draw a parallel of this and its literal element of, of sexual seduction to the seduction of Christianity. Sexual immorality is repulsive, but so is spiritual depravity. I'm, I'm referring here to the, to the gods of this world who would seduce you to compromise God's word and refuse to stand up for truth. Folly doesn't call out for those who are on the Broadway. Why? Because they're already on the path of death and destruction. Instead, folly calls out to those who are on the narrow path that's leading to everlasting life. So instead of listening to the loud, seductive voice of folly, tune your ear to the voice of the shepherd and hear his voice and follow his word and walk in his way because he is the way, the truth, the life that leads to life everlasting. I suppose a comparative list might help you to decide which path is wiser. There are some similarities, so, and there are some grave differences. So in the spirit of full disclosure, let's examine both of these ways. Both women, the wise woman and the foolish woman, herald their call from a high place in the city. We see that in verse 3 and verse 14. So both of them have found a place where they can, they can herald their call to people from a high point, a vantage point. Both of them prepare food for those who follow them. We see this in verses 2, 5, and 17. But that's where the similarities end and the differences begin because the wise woman knows what she's doing and her way leads to life everlasting. And again, we see this in verses 4 and 6. She knows exactly what she's doing. It's not secretive. It's nothing that has to be hidden. It's, it, it, she's in a part of, of, of that uh, uh, element of, hey, I'm going to help people. But the foolish woman, the Bible says, is simple and knows nothing. That's in verse 13. And she leads her prey to death. So as I said a few minutes ago, I want to ask again, is there really a difference? Or, or excuse me, is there really a choice, rather? There is a difference. Is there really a choice? If, if both voices are crying out from a high place, both are preparing food, fine. Let, let's now look at the differences. One is going to lead me to life. One's going to lead me to death. One knows what she's doing, and, 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 is, and it's pure. The other one doesn't know what she's doing, and it's death. I, I don't want to choose the wrong thing, and I don't believe you do either. So, Lord Jesus, I pray right now that each and every one of us, young, old, having lived for God for many years or just a few months, having served faithfully or having backslidden and returned, whatever the case or story may be, I pray that all of us would stop listening to the loud, seductive voice of folly and instead tune our ear to the voice of the true shepherd, that we would follow your word and walk in your ways knowing that you lead to life everlasting. We ask it and pray it in the mighty name of Jesus.
Amen. God bless you. We'll see you next week.